Ja. Hold off, it's still one minute. <laughs> but if we start early, we have more time for discussion. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the last series of parallel sessions. Uh, this one at nine o'clock in the morning after party yesterday evening probably has a difficult starting. Uh, we, we have today on that session the topic benefits of implementing so the European Union location framework. We have five speakers and uh, we can make, if we have sharp on a quarter of an hour for each presentation, we have then time for at least one question for each presentation and at the end uh, we can put all the questions that are more generic re regarding the topic in general and regarding, uh, let's say, the, the totality of the presentations of the morning. So. My name is Vanda Nunes de Lima. I guess that at that moment of the conference, I don't need to introduce myself anymore because in one way or another, <laughs> you saw me around. So, but uh, I'm part of the Inspire team. I'm working at the GRC and I'm involved in the, the Inspire support to implementation and maintenance and use of Inspire for other policies. So presentation done, I give immediately the floor to the first presenter, Mr. Uh, Joe Komp. Komfuts. Yes, Thank you, you did better. Thank you. I'm You're not the first one we had difficulties with. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is for my joy to see so many people attending this session after the gala dinner. And what we will do during the next 50 minutes is just to present the benefits, an approach to the benefits, a measurement to the benefits related to the European Union location framework. And this work has done not been alone, but a whole team was behind it. Dani was here, Van der Broeke, um, Ray, Bogoslavski, I think, other I don't see, but uh, we are with the whole team behind it. So, who of you is not familiar with the European Union location framework? Raise your hands. Okay, everybody is, uh, is aware of it, so I not have to introduce what is the European uh, Location Framework. That is an action to improve the inter uh, integration of location uh, information in e-government services. And this action aims to address an EU-wide cross-sectoral interoperability framework for the exchange and sharing uh, of location data and services. And, as you know, are all familiar with this European Union location framework. This is, um, the starting point is INSPIRE. That's not a surprise for you. And we would like to add complementary actions. For example, in terms of guidelines, standards, measures, strategic actions that somehow contribute to form a location-enabled government. So that's not only uh, focusing on Inspire, which is the case of, uh, which is not only focusing on uh, environment, which is the case for environment, but also focuses on other issues, other sectors, transport, marine, and many other. What I would like to stress is that it's not focusing on one area, but on multiple areas, in order to get to this uh, location-enabled government. Policy and strategy is an area, a focus area, a return on investment, effective governance and partnerships, e-government integration, and standardization inter interoperability. <coughs> I um, would not uh, tackle these issues, what's behind it, because that was well introduced during the workshop that was organized last Monday by Ray uh, Boguslavski and Paul Smits. They really tackled this in detail. So I will not take that into account, but these areas are fundamental for the rest of the uh, presentation. 
introduction. So we as assume that an EOLF, a European Union Location Framework, is intended to deliver a wide range of benefits. At least the benefits are higher than the costs. But exactly what are those benefits? And who can measure them? And can we set up an approach, an approach that is feasible, that's manageable, that's easy to achieve, to uh, measure, to identify the benefits? Because we are uh, focusing on uh, location-enabled government, we would like to have different insights, and mainly the different insights from the public administrative perspective, e-government perspective, e but not alone, in combination with geo-information and SDI domain. Why? We think that both are relevant and they both are a source of inspiration. Benefits to this. This is not the first study about the benefits of location information, about managing information, about creating um, uh, geographic information. We collected more than 40 studies. But what would they say, those studies, that we would like to know? And in order to uh, use that as a starting point for our approach. And it's a database which we have compiled, which is a repository dealing with uh, SDI and benefits and values. But what we see is that not many focus on the integration of location information in e-government processes. I would like to stress that. We have a lot of studies, but not really are specific for focusing on this e-government process. And not many look from a public administrative uh, or e-government perspective, although that's the aim of our study, to set up location-enabled governments. The starting point is also a set of benefits that we were derived from several e-government studies, mainly from the OECD. And these are categorized, these uh, indicators, in three groups. Some specific indicators relate to public administration, other ones relate to citizens and businesses, and broader benefits. A lot of things have been done. We have tried to assess those uh, studies. What we can learn from all these benefit studies that have been done so far. What we can, I would like to stress is, in general, and most of them, the costs are, uh, the, uh, the benefits are higher than the costs. But they focus on different levels. Some focus on services, some on processes, some on programs, some on countries, some about the world. They use different uh, methods and approaches. But what we learn also, it's complex all this. Do not simplify it, oversimplify it. And what we have to do also is to incorporate different views and understanding. In this sense, because we are dealing with location-enabled government, it would be wise to use in, uh, information or uh, learn from experiences from the e-government or from the public administrative perspective besides the one of location information or the, our GI uh, uh, domain. And also it's good to have a holistic approach and to get an, a comprehensive uh, view and a full, in order to get a full picture. So that is what we learn from these existing studies. But the objective was not only to learn from these existing studies, it's also a way to measure. Um, this, uh, the minute, uh, which could be relevant for implementing the uh, EULF. And the need to measure the benefits at different levels. We have three levels. One on program level, in this way could be the EULF. And what we have done, we, you can assume you have a set of input, we do something, for example, in this case, the EULF actions, you have an output, and derived from that, you can have some benefits. The same is relevant on a process level, on a business process level, and also for a service, an application. We have something as input, we do something in terms of guidelines, measures, 
actions, strategic actions, that, so, that leads to an output. And the difference is a benefit. So what I would like to do is now, I will give you an example of a process in where we measure, in which we attempt to measure the benefits related to the European Union location framework. And also two examples of services in which we have tried to es estimate the benefits. The benefit approach applied for process. Let's focus to the Netherlands. The, about the case, about the process, developing, exchanging and using spatial uh, plans in the Netherlands. According to the new Act for Spatial Planning in the Netherlands that came into force in 2008, municipalities, provinces, national authorities are obliged since 2010 to digitize their spatial data plans and also make them available as open data. This example is a good example in the context of EULF because it concerns, it deals with the areas of policy area, uh, alignment, e-government integration, return on investment, interoperability and partnerships. So these concern all the areas, focus areas of the EULF. And what we have done is a systematic analysis of this process using benefit indicators. What we saw using these indicators, that because of that they may have digitized the spatial plans in the Netherlands and had to make them open, uh, make them available as open data, is that the average duration has been reduced significantly from 46 to 18 half weeks. The quality has been improved of spatial planning and more consistency in services and products. It has also reduced costs in transmitting and plans and other relevant information. It's not as minimum amount to send the plans by mail, but just by email. And also, you see what the consequences of this uh, developing exchange and using the digital spatial plans in the Netherlands. 40,000 spatial plans are online available, making, the, making uh, their accessible, making their accessibility easier and faster. And more citizens are involved in the spatial planning process. Let's go to a beautiful country, Belgium, and a beautiful city, Leuven. And the city of Leuven is 25 kilometers east of Brussels. And this city uh, of Leuven has developed an advanced GS system that is strongly integrated in different work processes of the city. One module uh, of this uh, GIS refers to a web service uh, that the city servants can consult for uh, urban green administration and management. And what are the benefits for having such a service in place are the following. I think this is an example of a, also an, uh, is a relevant example in the context of EULF. It also deals with the e-government integration and return on investment. But what are the benefits? And it has, uh, are mainly in terms of time savings. Because we have such a service in place, it uh, saves time for licensing trees to chop down. 75 days, that's quite a lot for a municipality or for a town like Leuven. 50 days has it saved to, for querying data instead of visiting the terrain. 200 days, wow, really even, not, even much more. Improve planning by a foreman so he can do his task and his team in a better way and in a more efficient way. And searching for ownership of specific green uh, objects. 20 days, quite some numbers. This would save the city by having such a service in place quite almost 200,000 euros per year. And when we extrapolate it, if we assume, which is not the case, there is just an average city in Belgium, then you see quite a high number, almost more than 20 million. So there's a way to show that maybe the, uh, the actions of EOLF could make the difference. 
and I'm almost in the last three slides to left, leave. And then uh, the, another example of a service refers to the digital application for building permits, permits in Flanders. And this service aims to streamline the exchange of information between all relevant actors involved in the building application processes. For example, who are involved? Citizens, municipalities, enterprises and architects. And when we have such a service in place in Flanders, it will reduce costs between 116,000 and 166,000 uh, no, no, 166, not, not 1,000, but 166 euros and 166 uh, euros per building permit, depending on the type and the complexity of the building permit. So quite a number. If you remember, realize that a town has to deal with more, or a Flanders has to deal with numerous building per, uh, permits. And the municipality will save 4 to 0.2 to 6.2 hours per, I emphasize, per building per, uh, permit, depending on the type of building uh, permit. In total reduction of annual administration burden in Flanders, this will uh, re, um, have uh, maybe 12 million uh, euros, or an impact of 32 million, just to have a beautiful application in place. And I look also to uh, Derek Vrindje, who was quite strongly involved in this application. So when we have some questions, we have to go to you. So I would like to go, dear uh, Chair, to the conclusions. The approach, which I just have showed, is it's based on multiple perspectives. It's looking from the perspective of geo-information, spatial data information, but also, and even more important, focus on the public administration, e-governance perspective. It's applicable at program level, at service level, and at proce uh, process level. So it's referring to multiple levels. It's applicable for processes and services. And we have showed that it worked. And in this way, we would like to demonstrate that ELF makes sense. I would like to stop with this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation in a, a very important topic, which are around the benefits. Is there any question from the audience? Too early in the morning? So probably it will come at the end of the session. Thank you very much. I give the floor for the second presenter. Danny? Yeah. Van der Broek? Oh, okay. um, I will use this one. Okay, thank you, Vanda, for having this opportunity to have a short talk in this session as well. Uh, under the same uh, European Union, Union location framework uh, activities, um, my focus of the presentation is rather on an example of integration of Inspire services, potential integration of Inspire services in eGov processes. And I've taken the case of the health policy domain at European level. Also, this paper has been prepared by the team involved in EULF. Uh, this picture you have seen also in the previous presentation. Also here, that's the starting point. We focus on e-government integration. So the focus area of this presentation is on that focus area. Uh, in the context of the blueprint, which we have presented earlier this week in the workshop, the blueprint aims to give recommendations to member states and the Commission how this improved integration in eGov can be uh, made, made happen. Uh, there are several recommendations written there, and one of the recommendations is that we think that member states and in general also public uh, bodies at European level should focus more uh, on the process level and think from the processes that they manage. And uh, this should be also central in the development and the consumption of the components of spatial data infrastructures. 
So till now, Inspire was focusing a lot on the infrastructure itself, developing the different components, maintaining them. That's still relevant and very important. But we think if we want to have a successful uptake of these components, then we should look into the, the business processes of government. And one of the uh, practical recommendations coming out of the blueprint is that we propose to have a repository of governmental processes that are described in a standard, standardized way using BPMN, for example. It could be also something else, but uh, that's what we propose. So to describe, to map existing governmental processes to better understand them. What are we talking about? Um, well, you can have a, a theoretical talk about it. In, in short, the business process is a series of activities with some input, usually in the context of governmental processes. It's information and data in all kinds of forms. Uh, something is done with this information, it's processed, and it's leading to a new result, a new output in the form of statistics, maps, whatever. Usually these business processes, they consist of a lot of uh, different types of interactions, uh, usually a lot of government-to-government -government interactions, but also more and more government-to-business and government-to-citizen interactions. And it's clear that, as compared to a long time ago, more and more organizations are involved, uh, also and individuals, more and more individuals, citizens, for example. Uh, and also, it's usually not anymore a process at one level of authority. Usually, it's different levels. Let's alone think about the monitoring for the environment. All these processes are going from local to European, uh, and even globally. Um, more and more, these processes are cross-border, of course. Um, but also, the processes are more and more interlinked. So uh, even if there are a lot of stovepipes in the ICT world, also in the way of working in policy domain, in reality there is a lot of connections, or there should be connections. Some examples of business processes, well the building permit, uh, obtaining a build building permit is an example, uh, maintaining an address register for example, declaring set aside land under a common agricultural policy, uh, and so forth. So you can have a very, very long list of relatively complex processes with a lot of activities and sub-activities. And in the remainder of the talk, I want to focus on one example. So what, what we argue in the context of EULF is that we should focus more and more from this policy level, this generic level, towards the specific processes. And the example is on the, at the European level, it's called the Health and Consumer Protection Policy Area. You have a, a lot of sub-programs there, and one of them is health, uh, animal health and animal welfare. There is several uh, directives related to that. Uh, animal welfare, animal health is related to what is happening in the farm, but also what is dur happening during the transport of the animals. Also at the very end for the animal, unfortunately, in the slaughterhouse. Um, and for example, co practically on one of those aspects, uh, uh, you have a process which is called monitoring of the animal transport. There is uh, more than one piece of legislation on that. I've uh, re referenced here the, the most important one. And there is also already an existing, for a long time, an existing uh, administrative uh, system. Um, in the context of this animal transport, uh, uh, even if it looks uh, simple, it's quite complex. So there is several directives and also sometimes national legislation involved. Uh, it has to be monitored and that's done at European level by DG Sanko. But there's also clear links in this concrete uh, practical case with the agricultural sector, the transport sector, and potentially also with environmental policy. Uh, it's not only governmental bodies that are involved, but uh, obviously the transport sector and also, of course, the farmers that deliver <laughs> the animals. Uh, and also here you have a lot of bodies at stake that are involved in this process. Uh, at the European level, but also in the member states, you have customs, border control, you have veterinary bodies, and even individuals that act on behalf of uh, uh, public sector and so forth. You have even NGOs active in the field, media when something goes wrong and so on. Uh, to have an idea uh, about uh, the figures, uh, uh, the figures are a little bit older, but that was the last 
formal and official report of the Commission. In 2009, uh, we speak about almost 400,000 transports happening. And then you see some uh, different hours, times, and that is related to the directives. So there is thresholds, for example, if you are below eight hours, then certain rules apply. If you are between eight and 24 hours, other rules apply. If you speak about more than 24 hours, yet other uh, uh, rules apply. What is already done right now from the geospatial perspective is that uh, there is an estimation already of the journey time. And there is also already GPS tracking of the vehicles. That's already happening. Uh, they have to file a route plan. That's an obligation. That's in that trusses, uh, the trusses system. Um, of course, there is an identification of the commercial transporter, uh, the different authorizations, control mechanisms is quite complex. And there is also uh, another spatial feature that is that depending on the length of the duration of the journey, uh, you have to include what they, they call staging points. So I call it in uh, popular terms uh, animal hotels, hotels for animals. Uh, and you have also transfer points, for example, if you go from road to vessels, for example. Uh, in reality, the journey planning can become very complex. Uh, for example, the travel time is estimated at the beginning, before the travel, but the reality can be, ver be very different for obvious reasons. Uh, extending travel time can happen, occur, and that can influence the rules that apply. So if you have planned to have a journey of six hours, in reality it's maybe 15 hours, then other rules are apply. But also events can happen. Uh, so things can happen like an outbreak of a specific animal disease that can have an influence on the route. So it can be become really uh, complex and it should be noted that currently being uh, the system for outbreaks, monitoring outbreaks of animal disease is a totally separate system. So not really the integration that we are seeking for. Uh, so we are convinced, and if we analyze, and I have a few slides on that, uh, we are convinced that location information and services could really help to support uh, this process. If we want to map the process then, we speak about BPMN modeling. This is an example of flood mapping, totally different one. can be also very complex. This is at a generic level. If you zoom in, you have more detail. You have also sub-processes. You can drill down and uh, map that in more detail. I've done it quickly here for uh, the um, uh, monitoring of the animal transport. Um, the green areas, I will not discuss the different steps, but the green ones is where now currently location information is being used. It's even not using uh, Inspire services yet, it's just an internal commission, internal database mapping the routes, uh, it's using Teleatlas data that are behind and so forth. Anyway, that's what is done now. And so if you start to drill down in the process, you can see that different other places, and especially the next steps in the journey. Uh, uh, geographic information, location information could be used better and even inspire service could be integrated. Uh, for example, at the border control, they control the, the status of travel, but they don't have access to spatial information to verify if there is delays, what is the consequence or the impact on, on, on the, the journey, if they have to apply other rules. They have to do that all manually now. If, even furthermore, there is no clear link to the animal disease notification process. So if we would integrate that better, for example, also there the different uh, bodies involved in controlling could do that more in a more appropriate way using uh, location-based services. Um, I think this is a ju just a very generic level, if we have also a more detailed level, but then it's not really visible on, on the screen, then at a lot of places uh, there is an enhancement uh, or, and, and especially there is room for improvement of the use of location information. Um, so as I said, uh, currently it's used partially in the system uh, by the transporter. So the transporter is estimating the travel time, but he's guided if he's giving a totally irrealistic um, figure, for example, then the system will say, we think it's more travel time. 
So it's guided because there is an algorithm behind. More and more also other technologies are used already. Uh, like for example, there are already checks done using uh, satellite imagery where vehicles are, but also GPS. I don't know the details what is exactly happening there. It's stated, but I couldn't find uh, really information on how this is done. But uh, as I said before, location information could be used at several other points in the process. It's hardly used at the border control, but you have also other bodies and veterinary people that are going in the field and check all kinds of things. At that time, they need, in fact, the connection to uh, services, location-based services, but they don't have for the time being. Also, the staging point managers don't have uh, really access to this same information. Also, the, the ADNS people don't have access to the information on the animal transport and vice versa. So it's two different systems. Uh, so uh, we think that TRASIS, for example, that's an example where this could evolve towards a real paperless system because there's also still a lot of paper in there. Finally, that's uh, what, uh, my last slide, I think, with some content, is the estimated benefits of going completely paperless and also uh, uh, providing more access to uh, location-based services. Uh, we have uh, exact numbers of the journeys, different types of journeys, and then we have some information. It's an estimate uh, on the average number of controls per journey. And we have some examples of delays by the paperwork that has to be done and the checking of other systems. So we assume a very low uh, improvement that could happen if you use a location-based service of uh, 15 minutes per control. And if you would extrapolate that, for example, at the level of all these transport that's happening in one year in Europe, you would come up with a considerable amount of person days that are, are saved. That's just also an example of the benefits approach that has been explained by, by you. Uh, but the major measures, message, and this is my last slide, is that uh, it is for us it's important that EULF focus and has this perspective, this process perspective. So we should think more process oriented. Uh, we think that it's very advantageous then to use a standard way of describing these processes because this is done here and there, but not in a systematic way. So to better understand the data and information flows, how this goes. Uh, at the general, but also at a more detailed level. Um, and then indicating in this process exactly where uh, inspired services, for example, in this location information could be of use. Uh, and we think also that a more optimal integration of location information could really create important benefits, and that has also been demonstrated by the previous speaker. Um, and we could achieve this by partially by uh, inspired services. Of course, from this example, it's also probably other services. For example, the routing algorithms, that's not exactly the type of service that is foreseen in Inspire, but uh, some member states might develop uh, other type of service on top of the Inspire infrastructure. Okay, that's it. So if you want to have more information on this particular case, then you con can contact me. Uh, general, general request on the EULF, uh, well, the information is there. Uh, people in GRC will be happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Danny, any question from the audience? Good morning. Stefan Arnold from uh, Germany. In the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned in a half sentence statistics that could also be um, derived from, from such a system. Um, do you know if there's um, any contact already between maybe Eurostat or uh, yeah, other national statistical uh, organizations that uh, are aware of what you are? Uh, offering here as a service and if there has been already movements in using your information? Well, I don't know exactly where, uh, to which slide you refer, but in general terms, um, in most processes, we should be aware that you have, of course, these typical, typical processes that are uh, where the ma majority of the information is spatial information, like the flood mapping, but a lot of e governmental e 
uh, business and administrative processes, it's only a small part of the, the whole thing. And statistical data is the, the big chunk together with administrative information, with a lot of information on businesses, on persons, and so forth, depending on the case. Uh, so, of course, if you want to have a, a very good integration, um, then, uh, then you need to have an integration not only in a perfect way of the spatial data, but also of the other infrastructures. And uh, usually the administrative processes, they are starting from statistical databases and administrative databases. And what we see is that the location-based, the SDIs are isolated. It's totally separate from these processes. So I think uh, the other have done already part, part, part of the job. So I think it will be a joint effort for each process to integrate the right data, the right services, the right uh, background information to, be, to support these different processes. Moreover, some of these processes are a mixture of digital processes, but even some manual interventions and activities. So also there, there should be some reflection how that can be improved and how we can go to 100% digital uh, processes. But uh, to have an answer on your, your question, I think s s in some cases, not in this particular case, but in some cases, uh, statistical offices are already involved as data provider, like, like SDIs are in fact data providers for the geospatial part. Thank you. Any other question? So we pass to the third presentation. Now we move and we have now Laila Aslesen presenting ELF. Yes, thank you, Vanda. Good morning, everyone. Um, and you are this morning um, the lucky few who will be presented with the solution to many of the problems that were presented yesterday. And the solution is the European Location Framework. Uh, and uh, we are currently in the middle of the ELF project, uh, which is going to lead to the ELF platform which we really think is a necessary basis for good governance and a very important factor in uh, the processes that had just been described. So the ELF platform, uh, it is a geospatial reference infrastructure. Uh, the aim is to provide interoperable data and services, uh, eventually full coverage of Europe, uh, it will be uh, high quality, uh, it will have the metadata required, it will support international standards and inspire, uh, and it will manage national data through interoperable processes. Uh, I will not get much into the technical side of this. Uh, the next two presenters will uh, get more into that. Uh, but the aim is to provide authoritative, topographic, administrative, and cadastral reference data. Uh, what we want is to make these data easier to access, and we want to improve the overall user experience of getting this data. And we will provide what we think is a much needed and very useful basis for private businesses to uh, develop their own platforms, their own applications, as well, of course, being a very important platform for public bodies uh, in, in developing these systems that has been described. Uh, good governance, what is that? A good governance you get if you have a sound policy. But if you're going to make a sound policy, you need uh, adequate uh, and good quality information. And uh, we think that reference data is an essential requirement here. Uh, all information will increase in value if you can uh, associate it with reference data. If you know where something happened, and everything happened somewhere, uh, you will have a lot more information about it than if you don't. 
Uh, we provide what we call authoritative reference data. That means that this is basically the des designated national data set for that inspired team. Uh, a lot of it is produced by the mapping authorities, uh, national mapping and cadastral authorities. Some of it is produced by others. We uh, think that this is uh, valuable because it is maintained and updated according to a transparent and long-term mandate, also based on INSPIRE. Uh, we also think that in most cases this will be the best and must, must, most up-to-date uh, data available. So we need to make this available. And of course, we have to have a business model. It's no good having all these great services if people can't use them or access them. So uh, what we need is a user-friendly platform. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, whether you talk about a public body or a private institution or uh, whatever kind of organization, uh, what sits there is a person with a computer who push a button and expect things to work quickly. That is the expectations that have been created from the internet uh, over the last 10 years. They want it to be clear and easy to understand. Um, they want things to work together. They want to be able to combine uh, our services with other data. Uh, and they want immediate access. They want to have uh, testing opportunities, uh, not just to say that you, know, you have to wait um, uh, two months for an agreement before you can start uh, using this data. Um, so we uh, need to go for uh, a simplified system, modular agreement and normal language licenses uh, in order to put together uh, the agreements for the pro product that that particular user need and most importantly to present this in a way that uh, they easily understand what they cannot can and cannot do so as we all know who are internet users you get this click here for the full license you click and then you go on nobody reads it what you want to know is what can i do and how much is this going to cost me uh, we want this to be able to generate a, a product that uh, the customer needs on the fly, uh, but perhaps also in a more traditional way. If you're going to base your whole business on uh, a particular platform, you might want to talk to a real person and not just to um, a system, as I'm going to start describing. <coughs> So uh, we have a particular user experience in mind when we, when we uh, are building ELF. Uh, first of all, uh, the user is going to meet the showcase application. This is what was introduced here on Wednesday um, and which has been uh, shown this week on, on the uh, ELF and Jurgen graphics stand. Uh, it basically is a clear, easy insight into what ELF can deliver without having to register or anything like that. You can just see what is there. Uh, from that, there you will be able to utilize the Geo Product Finder, uh, which is uh, basically a tool that will help you to find, compare, license, and if required, also pay to get access to uh, the services that you wish to use. Uh, and from there, you should then have easy access to all the various uh, ELF services, applications, uh, and affiliated platforms uh, that will be available. Um, open data, everybody's talking about open data. Uh, there is a, a very, very clearly a trend, uh, and pub open public data is increasing. So this means that there will be a significant amount of open data available on the ELF platform. And we hope that this will increase as more and more uh, uh, providers of reference data are looking to, to uh, open their data, uh, being this uh, a very necessary basis for governance in their own and in other countries. Um, and we're going to present this with what we call the ELF Open License. 
uh, one of the uh, aims is actually to have a common open license for reference data. Um, actually, um, it might sound like opening the data and everything is fine, but the fact is that everybody who opens uh, the data have their own license. Uh, for some reason. Um, and you would think that open public data could be done according to the same license, so we will have a go at that. So the idea is that you will have a single access for both open and restricted data. Uh, you will have a license for the open data. You will have license and possibly payment for restricted data. Uh, and then there could be data that are open data but are still restricted uh, in the sense that they contain personal data or have other restrictions. But at the end of the day you will get a li one license and uh, one price for what needs to be paid for and, and one single access for all the various things you have chosen to use. Uh, so the access uh, will, to the various applications and services will uh, be, uh, you could say, on a, on, a, on a freemium model where you will have some will be free and others will be paid for. Uh, some, in some instances, some countries, of course, it will be free all the way because they have opened their data. The ELF base map is meant to be a free VMTS service. The ELF geolocator uh, is a geolocator uh, where you can search for places with, with names and, and addresses and so on. Um, and it will be a limited free use of that with the showcase application and base map, uh, depending on uh, the country's uh, various uh, policies. But some use of it will be free. Uh, you will have what this will be described later, the ELF global and regional services, uh, which are based on the existing geographics uh, products, which are partly open data and partly uh, paid for data, and uh, is uh, aimed to have a testing license available, as it indeed is for your geographics products today. Uh, we will have uh, the ELF national services, which again, as I said, some, are, some have open data, some have partly open data, and some have restricted data. And at, in all cases, there should be a testing license available. So to try and sort of describe this, I won't get into the technical stuff again, as I said, but you will have these various services coming into the platform. Um, and from there, there are sort of two tracks. It's the open services and it's the restricted services. Um, and for the restricted services, you need a technical limitations. You need a, a protection. It could be because of licenses. It could be because of personal data. And then both of this will go into the Geo Product Finder, where the user can find it and eventually uh, be used from applications and affiliated platforms. So you can see the user experience will be to go down from the top in, in this um, uh, pla plaque. Uh, so, what we want, easy and fast licensing. After all, if you have online services that people can uh, access with a click, you should have be able to license it by a few more clicks. So, what we're planning is a visit-style user interface in the Geo Product Finder. Uh, it will generate and present the license, uh, and that will also, in, in each case, you will get um, uh, 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 what the same as you do with the uh, uh, with the CC license that you will have a simple, you can do this and you can do that version and then click here for the full version. And if payment is required, you will get a price for all of it. Um, initial questions will be on what you want to use it for, internal use, applications, uh, download, etc. Um, and then the system will generate more detailed questions depending on your first choices. Uh, how, how do you see the reuse in the application? Uh, what is the extent of your internal use? Uh, how much do you want to download? Etc. And then finally, uh, it will ask you for what payment options you want. Do you want to pay for a subscription? Do you want to pay per transaction? Etc. 
Um, I've tried to describe this. Uh, so you have a user interface and you have the wizard and uh, the user interface will select the services. Uh, based on this, the wizard will then uh, create the initial questions. Uh, Post the questions, the user will answer them. Uh, the wizard will then select what terms and, and price elements comes from these answers. Maybe generate more uh, questions when it's necessary. This could go on a couple of rounds. And then finally present the user with an agreement with terms and prices and say you can do this and you pay that and here's the full big license if you like to read it or download it. So the road ahead, uh, as you say, we are in the middle of the ELF project. Uh, we are developing the business side and the technical solutions through the project. Now, the most important thing uh, in, a, in a technical solution like this, in a technical infrastructure, is that what we present has to work. It's no point in us offering off services if they are not working well, uh, they are stable, they, we, we can guarantee to some extent that it will be up when people need it. And the same goes for the business solutions. There's no point in us offering, um, let's say, a transaction-based payment method if we have no way of, of actually counting the tra transactions. And then you will have a discussion when we build up this, where would the, where will the count, this counting of the transaction be? Will we do it? Would the application provider do it? Will it be a choice, etc.? So we have to develop these technical solutions to go with the business model. And uh, we need to prioritize what we really need to get the platform started, which means that the, it's, it's likely that the platform initially, in its initial operating stages, will have a very limited amount of business models, but these will be mis business models that we have tested and we know that they will work also on the technical side. Uh, the, the fact is that the services we are providing mostly requires an application or desktop solution to be used. Uh, my most uh, most uh, users don't uh, know how to use a VMS or VFS service directly, and they don't really care for it. Most of them want a map. Uh, so we need to work with the application providers and with the platform providers to make sure that uh, the initial version of the business model is what they need for their purpose. Uh, also, uh, there will be special requirements that need special technical solutions. As I said, if you come to, for example, personal data, uh, according to European law, it will be a question of who you are and where you are, which means that uh, you can't do this anonymously. You would need to be able to identify the user, so we have to have solutions for possibly digital signatures, uh, federation-based access systems, etc. Uh, and again, this has to be in place and it has to work and it has to be user friendly before we can present it to anyone or we would just annoy people by not being able to use what we are offering them. So uh, what I see is that the ELF project will uh, in uh, another two years uh, deliver a fully operational but never quite finished platform. We need to evolve and we need to work further. Uh, with what we have, and uh, in a way, if we if we were fully developed and finished, that in itself may be a failure because then we will stagnate. So, thank you. Thank you, Laila. Is there any question? Immediate question. Good morning. My name is Andreas Fajirafts. I represent the Department of Lands and Service of Cyprus. You referred to your presentation a few times about uh, the need to have a business model. So do you refer to individual business models per organization or for, do you refer to a national business model or a strategic plan, I would say, which should be covered by legislation? And if it needs to be covered by legislation, what is the relation to inspire legislation? Uh, I refer to the business model for ELF, um, and 
the situation is that today uh, we already have business models for the geographics products in which then the data providers, mostly mapping authorities, are providing their data um, and they are doing so according to their national policies. So it's in a way it's their responsibility to, to deal with this according to their national policies. And the same will be expanded with ELF uh, and uh, we, will, we will have a common business model for ELF and then we will have to uh, accommodate the data providers uh, to make sure that happens. And as I said, that means that there will be data sets that may be available for free in some countries, but not for free in other countries, depending on uh, the various uh, uh, data providers uh, national policy um, and uh, but uh, along the way we also want to provide them with tools and helps and material to maybe develop the national services policy uh, so that they both can deliver their national policies according to ELF but at the same time have it in this infrastructure with a common business model because it needs to be a common business model or this won't work yeah. so is that answering your question yes thank you Thank you. Um, Ray Bogoslowski from the European Union Location Framework uh, Project. Um, ELF is good, thank you, and will be very useful, uh, I'm sure. Uh, my question is about uh, your uh, CIP funding. Uh, under your CIP funding, uh, will you be making uh, some of the uh, assets that you create uh, in uh, ELF uh, uh, available as reusable assets for others to perhaps use. I'm thinking uh, in particular of the um, your licensing framework. Uh, you put a lot of thought into that, and it, it's very it's very useful. And, and I'm wondering if uh, just the framework uh, could actually be made made available to to others to to use. They may have different licensing terms, of course, but the uh, but the software framework may be useful for others. Yes, um, it has, uh, I mean, there will, there will be a mixture in, in the project, of course, but it was always my intention when, when I started working with this that so things like a Geo Product Finder should be mainly based on open source software and therefore be reusable for others. Uh, we, we need also to make sure that commercial operators, in a way, can uh, sort of integrate their commercial software in, into the Geo Product Finder so that uh, people could choose the commercial license licensing software that they like and already use uh, and not use the open software. But I think the, the answer to your question is yes, I, I think we foresee that uh, things will be um, uh, reusable. I think maybe that Doris will get back to this in, the, in his pr presentation. Yes. So thank you, Laila. I've, we can keep more questions to the end of the session if time allowed. And you pass to Auntie Jacobson presentation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um I will talk about the, as, as the previous speaker, Laila, was talking about the European Location Framework. Um, I'm the technical coordinator for this project. And I'm mostly going to be focusing on, the, on where we are and what we are going to do in the future. If you are interested to know what we are actually trying to achieve, I would advise you to go to the ELF project website. There's a lot of presentations of, of, of general presentations of the project and it, it goes. So I'm not going to um, go to, uh, to details of what we are trying to achieve. I'm, I'm mostly referencing where, where we are at this point. Um, Yesterday there was a session uh, inspired crossroads where there was uh, um, various um, thinking of what inspire should be uh, doing in the future or how the inspire should be coming useful. 
um, um, the panelists came up um, that there's a need to focus on users and then there was a question on on comple complexity of inspire how to uh, how to address these and i think the el project is actually ad addressing these issues quite well because we are trying to build uh, an operational service based on inspire services that would be uh, available for uh, real user communities through applications and we want to do it simple so even the inspire is complex we want to uh, to provide inspire as simple as possible to users in the way they want to utilize so that's that's the main focus of the of the european location framework lila was showing this picture already about, about um, uh, what we are trying to do. Um, what I will um, f uh, let uh, focus here is that we are building a geospatial reference infrastructure. So this is not a project that is trying to build a service. Uh, it's it's not the project that is trying to build a geo portal. We are trying to really build a geospatial reference infrastructure. It's a it's a quite complex project. We are actually trying to achieve a lot of things that the NMCAs have tried to achieve over many, many, many years, in, in three years. So, so we have uh, um, parts that, uh, for example, Doros is going to talk about generalization parts, uh, a lot of tool uh, development in, inside the project. And that's, that creates also a complexity of, of, uh, of course to a project because we are at the same time creating this basis of how to actually put this uh, data available using using all these tools that we are developing and at the same time we are trying to focus on the on the usability of data and trying to get the application to connect to the to ELA platform so that that creates a, a challenge for us let's say like that um, then I'm going to show you the um, where we are a video short video clip if it works where we are at this point so so basically we launched the ELF um, uh, platform or and the affiliate platform just uh, Wednesday and uh, I'm going to show you the showcase video uh, of, uh, of certain services that we are um, uh, have connected now to the infrastructure. Uh, I have to address that, of course, this is not um, the uh, the everything that we are offering. So it's it's just a few uh, few uh, clips of of that that we are offering. So it doesn't open. So let's see if we can see it here. Yeah, it's here. So that was the location framework.eu, and then we uh, then we go to the showcase application, and here we uh, zoom in uh, uh, to uh, uh, to our European base map. So that's basically using the current Euro regional map, um, and uh, we are now using the geolocator service and uh, searching for Arbog, and it finds certain things. Uh, uh, from our database, so it founds addresses and it finds geographical names. So we have addresses from Ge uh, Denmark. We try first the Arbog way and we find out that it's not uh, nearly uh, everywhere. It's not even close to the Arbog, and then we try the geographical names and it uh, shows where where the Arbog is. And we zoom in a little bit. Uh, so. Basically, the base map that we are currently using doesn't have yet the national part, so it will be more detailed in the future. It will uh, contain the national details. Then we try the uh, ELF regional services. So now you can see that there were uh, uh, data coming uh, from uh, from our regional services. And if, it, if we hide the background map, we can see that it was of real uh, data coming from those services. 
So that's uh, that's uh, uh, the region level that we are currently currently offering. And then we are trying to uh, go to uh, uh, the northern part of Sweden, Finland, and Norway, where we are trying to uh, see the geographical names services. Those are web feature services that we have connected. So we have to zoom in a little bit, and then we then we uh, select the geographical names. So we click those uh, Norway, uh, Finland, and Sweden, and then the services are selected. Uh, but you can see that you have to so for web feature services you have to zoom in a little bit because of course there's a limitation how much data you can you can see from the web feature services. You have to zoom a little bit, and now it uh, now it uh, shows the, the data coming from Finland and Sweden. Those are the geographical names. And if you click uh, certain features, it shows the content of what is available from those uh, and what is the source of source of data and what is the actual data. <coughs> then we uh, also go to uh, let's uh, check uh, also that Norway Norway is uh, Norway is there. So so it, you can also see the. Uh, the, the data in this kind of table form, what is available from different services. And then we are going to Norway to see that there's some data, the geographical names from Norway as well. So the red uh, triangles are coming now from Norway. And if you click the uh, the uh, cr uh, cross border point, you can see that there is data from Norway, uh, and then there's some data from Sweden uh, from that same point that is is there. So basically, that's that's where we are at this point. So, what are the data services and and the content that we have uh, that we have available? So, we have Euro Geographics data, uh, Euro Global Map. That's an open uh, data. It's it's available as a web service, and that is currently available from RGS Online. Um, we also have Euro Boundary Map web service uh, there, but it's not uh, open data yet, or not having uh, having uh, yet available to be to to be utilized. Um, and then we have uh, regional map uh, layers as a web map tile service uh, available. We have the uh, first version of the ELF base map. We have the ELF geolocator with certain content. So we have geographical names from 20 countries. We have addresses from three countries and administrative units uh, from one country. And then we have the ELF national services, which are web feature services and web map services. And those are the uh, countries, a number of countries that, are, that we have currently available for those. And then we have metadata also available from few, few countries. Uh, if you want to, um, to start utilizing the, um, the um, the ELF data, the most important thing is that you would have to uh, go to our documentation. So if you click the documentation button from the locationframework.eu, you will be fi uh, finding that there's a, there's a part of terminology, the specifications, there's data sets, there are geo tools, ELF platform services, RGS online services, applications, and application developers. So this is the main uh, point where you would be searching what we are going to be offering. So the showcase application offers you the view of, of the data, but this, this will be offering you the actual, actual services that we are, uh, we are offering at this point. And then if you click, for example, the, uh, I think this is the data sets. So this is the, uh, the information that we have from from the data sets available that you can you can see. So basically, that's a that's a that's a point you where you would be able to see where what what we are offering at this point. So what we are going to offer uh, further ahead, we are uh, working on the national level details. 
So this is uh, the base map will, uh, will, will contain the national data in the end. We are going to be uh, offering more national data. And as you saw from the beginning, the, the target, of course, is to reach the, uh, the European coverage. Uh, we are going to be starting these national events for application developers. So that's, that's the way to reach the, uh, the communities that, are, um, that would need um, to utilize uh, uh, AELF. So we are going to be uh, going to a number of countries and, and, and have an event for the application developers and users where we are going to be explaining how they can connect to ELF. Then we are going to, uh, what you didn't see yet is that uh, you didn't see cascading services. So that is something that we are going to offer. So basically the cascading service means that as a user you don't necessarily have to know what country is offering the data. So basically you just select a team like uh, geographical names and then wherever you go the, the cascading service will be offering you the data. So at the moment in the showcase application you see the, the national data providers but as a, uh, when we have the cascading service available then you wouldn't see that. We are looking to connect also uh, thematic other data sets uh, to, to the ELF platform. Um, uh, as uh, Lila was talking about, the GeoProc Finder functionalities will be uh, included. And then uh, we, uh, the showcase application also provides an easy way to publish web maps. This functionality is not uh, yet open, but we will open, uh, open it uh, uh, in the future. And then it is very easy to select certain data sets, create uh, a view, what you want to do, and, and basically put it in your own website. And you can utilize, uh, create, a, let's say, an easy application for certain purposes utilizing the showcase application. So we are creating an alternative reference geo information infrastructure for Europe. So that's, that's what we are trying to do. Thank you. Thank you, Antti, for this, let's say, comprehensive presentation. Is there any question? We still have time for one question. Yeah. In your presentation, you referred to, your, uh, to geographical names coming from which databases? Is it the... Uh, They're coming the from European national data sets, national services. From your original map? No, no, they are, at the moment the geographical names are coming from, there's a previous service called EuroGeoNames. Yes. So some of this is coming from the EuroGeoNames database, and some of them are coming directly from the ELF national services. So the, the future will be that we will connect directly the national services to ELF. So, so the EuroGeoNames database will be then obsolete in that sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we can pass to the next presentation. Still within the topic of ELF from another perspective. Doros Cruz, please. Okay. I guess I have the prize uh, for um, the longest uh, title of a uh, presentation for the Inspire conference. <laughs> and um, where is it here? Yeah. So I thought if I, uh, if the others take more time and I have not time enough for my presentation, then at least you know what kind of tools we deliver with uh, ELF. Um, yeah, so I, um, yeah, I'm also um, talking about ELF, uh, about the implementation of the of the geo tools. Um, and uh, well, as Antti already uh, said, um, we want to m to make it simple. Uh, so that's also why. The GeoTools are a, a big part of the ELF project. We want to provide the NMCAs uh, 
uh, with the right tools so that they're um, that they can they have more benefits they have they can easy uh, easily uh, provide us with their data and um, so they have all the tools uh, available to um, to uh, make sure that we have all the data of Europe. Okay, um, I work for the Dutch cadastre, uh, 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 where I'm uh, responsible for the, the Netherlands uh, SDI, and uh, within uh, ELF, uh, I'm the overall coordinator of uh, of the resources for for cadastre, and I'm work package four leader. Um, I won't go into the ELF project uh, overall um, uh, uh, slides, but within ELF there are nine work packages, and one of them is the implement implementation of the GeoTools. And uh, so we're talking about seven tools that I would like to update you on what the status is and um, how what we did last year, what we're going to do uh, next year, what the deliverable uh, dates are for those uh, seven tools, and um, uh, yeah, what uh, the next uh, concrete actions are uh, for the next couple of months. So we have six tools uh, for uh, for NMCAs. The first six, and the, the seventh one is a little uh, is a little different from that, and that's the geo product finder that Laila was also talking about. So um, there are more tools than only in Work Package Four. So I'm uh, I, want, I just wanted to mention that uh, within Work Package Two, where the specifications and, and the specification for the base map are uh, are created, um, uh, we use a scale master so that we can easily. Uh, um, design uh, tiling uh, uh, schemas on all kind of levels within work package 3 where the services are uh, developed uh, we uh, we uh, we develop an, an, a compliance testing uh, service uh, of course uh, oscary and arcgis online have been uh, discussed uh, the whole week and you can easily uh, get demonstrations of, uh, on that um, at the, uh, at the ELF booth, uh, and, and, and I also wanted to mention that in Work Package 7 we are working on the uh, table joint service. Uh, it's a um, uh, uh, Dutch cadaster and also a Slovenian uh, um, uh, partner uh, are working on the user interface on that and, uh, and the table joint service to have that statistical data uh, referenced uh, uh, with, uh, with location. Um, with the mo most of the tools are in work package 4, so that I want to go into detail in those tools. The first one is a transformation tool. We have two partners working on that. One is Snowflake. Uh, there was a transformation uh, workshop early this week. Um, they have the tool uh, Go Publisher. Um, it has been completed already, the tool, so it has been tested on the, U, uh, the regional uh, data, the, the global data. Um, we are working now to uh, to transform some data also from uh, IG in France uh, uh, on master level, and uh, so it will be uh, configured again when we have uh, issues, when we have uh, incidents or uh, feedback from users that are uh, NMCAs that are using it. So, but it has been delivered already, and it's available for all partners uh, uh, of ELF. Um, and uh, but we continue working on it. Uh, Delft University has, uh, has uh, uh, offered their uh, open source tool Hill. Uh, we will compare if there are differences in functionality on that and if there is an NMCA want to work with, with Hill as a transformation tool we will provide that and um, we will also um, use some resources from uh, Delft University to assist NMCAs in transforming their uh, data as well. So that's about the transformation tool. The other one is a data quality validation tool. We have three uh, uh, software providers for that. Uh, one is One Spatial. Um, they have their tool, uh, One Spatial Cloud, that has already been tested. Uh, it was based on the uh, on the 100, 170 rules of the um, of the uh, um, Asden project, and that's been tested on the regional uh, data. 
So uh, we are still uh, in progress on, on, uh, on developing that. The deliverable date is uh, September uh, for the data quality validation tool. If you want to have more information, it's also on the ELF uh, Geographics booth. There are, I think, still uh, a resource from uh, from one spatial available to show you anything on that. Um, ESRI is providing their uh, RGS data reviewer. They are now um, working closely with uh, with Spain on uh, getting the the tool ready and configured and tested on their data. Uh, so they will uh, provide the uh, data reviewer uh, for the data quality validation tool and Delft University has developed their tool PP repair um, and that has also been tested on the regional and global uh, data and they are now uh, testing it on the uh, master uh, level data so that we will, can also in Q3 uh, uh, provide you with, uh, with that tool. Um, visualization for visualization, we uh, we work on an SLD editor that uh, has been uh, done now by uh, National Land Survey Finland. Um, so that's an open source tool. Um, we um, after summer break we will start working again for the for the last. Um, uh, last features and functionality that will be uh, uh, developed. So um, there is al already a mock-up uh, presentation of the SLD edit editor available, but um, the, the, the delivery date, planned delivery date, is uh, February 2015 for this. Change detection tool. Um, IGM France is working on this. There has been a, a first release on this has been delivered. We have uh, we work closely with Work Package 2 on the specifications, and we kind of in in, in an agile um, way of developing it. Look at look at some functionality, some specifications, and then uh, develop a new version of it uh, step by step. So um, it has own, only a, a delivery date of uh, month 30. So that's still a one and a half year ago ahead, but um, uh, we are still working on uh, each uh, uh, each version every time, and um, um, yeah, so that's IG in France uh, who will deliver this tool. On GeoProduct Finder, um, has already been uh, discussed by Lila. We have yet uh, a, a first version is, is already available with uh, met metadata uh, uh, re uh, search has been um, uh, has been already delivered and uh, a catalog. Uh, the next development will be on uh, the feedback service. We have uh, found uh, an open source uh, solution on that that has been. Um, uh, created by uh, uh, a company from Delft uh, in a uh, GeoVicwa project, also a, a, an EU pro uh, project. So that will be integrated by National Land Survey Finland into the GeoProdefiner. And we will also work on the license management uh, service. Uh, and the uh, Finnish uh, Geodetic Institute will uh, integrate that in the GeoProdefiner as well. Uh, we work closely with Work Package 9, uh, so uh, there has been a lot of progress on uh, the last couple of months on the on the framework uh, agreement. So um, uh, whatever functionality is uh, extra needed in the GeoProduct Finder will be developed in uh, the upcoming year. I think the deliver yeah deliverable date will be in uh, February 2015. Edge matching tool. Again, the same uh, three uh, software providers. One spatial have, has their tool, one integrate. Uh, we work now on some uh, uh, test data from the uh, cluster area Poland, Czech Republic. And um, um, so they are working on their tool. Um, and uh, Delft University has their PP repair also that uh, uh, detects uh, uh, differences in, uh, in uh, on the border. And uh, and uh, automatically repair uh, is repairing it. We work clo also closely with Work Package Two on if there is a use case for this, uh, for autom that automatically uh, repairing it. So um, if so, then further development will go into the tool. Um, 
S3 has their uh, IGS 10.2.1 released and there is edge matching functionality in that as well. So they work now also uh, uh, on development of that, uh, that tool and, and, and configuring it. Um, so there's quite some uh, progress on that and we uh, hopefully have the, we are well, focusing now in Q3 to have uh, some functionality available that we can share with, uh, with other NMCAs and test on the real uh, uh, master level data as well. Generalization tool, then um, there are three ways uh, within generalization. One is the regional to global uh, generalization that has been uh, uh, taken care of by uh, IGM France. They have already uh, made a lot of progress in developing the tool for um, for some uh, for three teams, and uh, the other themes have to be uh, planned uh, uh, still. But um, so IGM France is taking care of the regional to global. Then there is uh, one spatial and uh, Cadastro Netherlands with uh, with Esri. They are working on the generalization uh, process of master level one. And that's like uh, one to, to, to 10,000K till uh, master level two, that's the 50K. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, going on uh, the last, uh, I think, uh, three quarter of a year to have the generalization rules and the specifications ready. So you have done a lot of workshops on it to first have high level requirements and now the detailed re uh, requirements. Uh, we have now planned to have before summer to have the uh, requirements finalized so that the software providers can really start uh, configuring and, and working on the tools. So it looks very, uh, very good uh, in progress on this. Um, and there is Delft University. They have an, an, an open source tool, various scale. It's more on a, on a cartographic uh, kind of generalization. Uh, they have tested that as well, and um, they are now working on testing it in uh, on the ELF data. And um, further plans for that have to be taken. So what will we do next period? Well, now that we have already started the basis of each tool, we want to re uh, reconfigure and work, uh, uh, work further on it with the real data. So we work closely with the cluster areas and their data by testing the tools. Uh, we want to help NMCAs transform their data. So if there is any NMCA who wants to get some help from ELF in um, workshops and uh, um, uh, education on transforming and uh, some resources within uh, to, to help you transform the data, then um, do contact me for that. Um, we, we go out to the, to the NMCAs to, uh, to show what the tools can do. Uh, we do that by uh, webinars, by uh, uh, workshops, by conferences. The, um, so um, you, you will uh, find um, invitations on that. Uh, I think by, uh, we will use uh, your graphics uh, in, um, in helping us uh, reach out to you. So, um, and there's a, a quality event planned in January. ELF is also uh, 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 co-organizing co that on, on, uh, on data quality validation. And uh, we will make sure that the tools that are delivered by ELF on data quality, will be demonstrated there, will be uh, in workshops, um, whatever is needed. Um, so um, yeah, that will, that will be also a very good showcase for us to have that tool uh, presented over there. Any questions? Uh, for now, we have uh, three minutes. Uh, otherwise, please uh, do contact me, send me an email, uh, call me. Um, th this is my email address. I'm also on the ELF uh, project uh, website. You can find my uh, details. If you need any assistance or any information on the tools, uh, you can find me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very useful information now that you summarize with your presentation. Any question from the audience? Thank you. I'm Udo Mark from the German municipalities uh, providing addresses. I have a question about your validation. 
How do you handle the voidable fields? How do you handle? The voidable, the fields which are voidable. If you look to the Inspire data models, you will find some of the fields are voidable. The reason for that is, for example, in the addresses, that they haven't been in, this, in the address files at this time when the model was um, created. But from the use cases, we have found out these attributes are necessary. Well, I really... Uh, do you know? Um, well, I would, I would say that... Uh, is there a rule for that? Um, we are um, working on, on those within work packets too. So Anja Hopstock yeah. from uh, BKG Germany, if you email her, she probably will be able to answer that question. Yeah, so the data quality validation tool will, uh, will validate if the rules are uh, followed and the rules are uh, developed by uh, work package too. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second question is uh, going to Laila. I think uh, the question is of how you measure and how you have included actuality in your um, processes. I think you can validate everything, but you must have it. And if it's, for example, the German uh, national uh, address data set, yes, is nearly one year old in the medium. Yes, how you handle this? It's part of the metadata as well? Yes, uh, I would say yeah. that would be my question. As I say in the um, Geo Product Finder, you can find and, and, and review and compare and so on, and that would be based on the metadata. So if it's one year old, well, then you will see from the metadata that it's one year old. Uh, so we, we're not really proposing to telling people what they should and should not ch choose. We're just providing with, with all possible information and then it's up to them whether they think it's useful or not. Any other question? In fact, it's not a question. It's to try to answer to Udo's question about voidable. We have the idea in the specification to have not only the tool validated the rules, but also making some statistics about how attributes are populated. So it might, in the reporting, give very useful information about which attributes are really populated and which are not. Isn't this a, a good topic for the data quality uh, event? Because we have also the, in a discussion with an ELF, where where are we going to use the, the data quality validation tool? Are we only are we? Uh, is it for the NMCAs to validate uh, their the quality of their data? Is it for ELF to validate hey what kind of what is the quality of data we're providing? Uh, so there are many ways that you can. Uh, use the uh, uh, quality evaluation tool, yeah. Uh, Antti? So, so it's not really a question. No. Um, uh, related to this uh, quality event, so the quality event will be 20 to 21st in January, Malta. It's an open event. Uh, we will publish the, um, this event soon. Um, so if you're interested, please uh, please consider participating or sending a paper. Um, what we do with the data quality validation tool within ELF is actually that we are not only considering uh, this producer type of validation, uh, we are also considering user uh, requirement-based validation. Um, and we have, um, we are going to start uh, with our, uh, one use case, which is an insurance use case, and, and, and taking those requirements, and then we will validate if, the, if our data is, is usable for, for that use case. So partly that answers the, um, your question as well on, on the actuality. Thank you very much. Important clarification, this one, because the first question is validate, validating against what? So mm. it's important. Is there any urgent question that cannot be uh, taken during the coffee break? 
looks like it's not the case. So we can close the session and join the coffee break now and the plenary next. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's the